right, well, um, I'm Ben Bedger, uh, Cooking the Keepers and your organizer. And uh, can we have the, the slideshow up? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so this is uh, this is Repower the Peninsula, um, which is our discussion of HEA's renewable goal, um, the, the goal of being 50% renewable by 2025. Um, and so, so at this, uh, in this series, we've been talking about all the different technologies that HEA could use to, uh, to reach this goal. Um, we've been talking uh, about, uh, about a different technology every month. In January, we talked about solar, or I'm sorry, in December, we talked about solar. Um, in January, we talked about wind. And uh, today we're talking about hydropower and storage. And uh, what solar and wind have in common is they're both variable renewables. Uh, the, the wind rises and falls, the sun uh, goes in and out of clouds and uh, the power you get from those sources fluctuates. So a renewable grid uh, needs, uh, needs some steady power uh, to compensate for that. And it needs, uh, it needs a means of storing energy and delivering energy um, to sort of follow the fluctuations in, in the, the energy supply from those variable renewables and, and the demand as well. So that's what we're talking about today uh, to, uh, to sort of steady power sources that could that could help even out those uh, those curves and power supply. Um, so uh, one uh, one fact about hydropower is that uh, next slide please. Most of most of the renewable generation, well all the renewable generation mostly that exists in the in the rail belt uh, today is is hydropower. Um, it's uh, the rail belt's about 80% fossil fueled, about 20% renewable, and of that 20%, um, most of it is hydro, and most of that hydroelectricity uh, comes from one source, which is the facility you see in the background of that slide, uh, the Bradley Lake uh, power plant on the south side of Catchmack Bay. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, Bradley, Bradley Lake um, is, has been around since 1991, which makes it kind of young for a hydropower project. And it still has, it still has some room to grow. Um, it has about uh, 120 megawatts of capacity, but there are, uh, um, it's, it's, it's possible there are proposals being considered now that involve channeling more water into it, uh, perhaps raising the dam, uh, perhaps adding a, a new turbine um, that would, uh, potentially increase the capacity to 150 megawatts. And the utilities are, are generally pretty keen on this uh, since Bradley Lake generates the cheapest power on the rail belt. Um, I, I believe the, the price per kilowatt hour is, is around half that of, uh, of natural gas generation. Um, but we won't be talking so much about Bradley Lake tonight um, as, as about uh, the possibility of new hydro projects. Next slide, please. Um, so this is this is a map from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory um, of uh, uh, small hydro projects, mostly around the rail belt. And if you if you look at the key, uh, you'll notice that uh, NRL's idea of a small hydro project is still pretty big. Um, but uh, but most of the, most of the hydro potential in, in the rail belt um, is uh, sort of smaller projects like this uh, between. Uh, 10 megawatts and a few hundred. Uh, Joel, uh, who you'll hear from in a bit, uh, has, has, a, has estimated there are about 100 megawatts of small hydro projects in South Central Alaska. And uh, another uh, fact that I got from him is that uh, there, in the past 35 years, there have been about two megawatts of, of hydropower added to the rail belt. So it, it has not been adopted at a very rapid rate. And we'll be talking uh, more about why in our panel discussion. Um, so, so there is this potential here. Um, and uh, we should ask um, how much of it uh, should we use. Next slide, please. Uh, these are comments that Cook and the Keeper gave um, on the, the Grant Lake Hydro project when it was uh, being, when it was getting its FERC permit. These are the, the final comments. And uh, in the Keeper didn't, uh, uh, in their final comments, uh, these are by Bob Shavelson. Um, we weren't really for it or against it, but we did have 
um, these uh, these conditions that we thought uh, the project should should meet. And I think this is a, a pretty good general list of uh, things things to consider when thinking about how uh, small hydro can exist in our watershed and coexist with healthy healthy salmon populations. Uh, next slide, please, Satchel. Um, the uh, uh, in these comments, uh, Bob Shavelson talked about preserving genetic diversity among the salmon populations, uh, preserving water temperature, water flow, uh, prioritizing the salmon populations, and uh, all the cumulative effects from hydro. So we'll be uh, sort of sort of discussing more about how um, we can we can sort of sort of preserve these things and have uh, and have affordable renewables. From hydro. Um, so next slide. Um, so so we'll get our we'll get our panel started. Um, we have uh, Mike Salzetti uh, from Homer Electric, um, who's been spearheading the Grant Lake Hydro Project, which you'll hear more about, and uh, Joel Groves, uh, who's uh, who's been a consulting engineer on a number of hydro projects and also. Uh, um, is uh, developing the Fisher Creek Hydro Project um, near Hatcher near Hatcher Pass as an independent power producer. Um, so if we can uh, stop sharing and hand it over to them. So, uh, oh, uh, so first, uh, first uh, Joel and Mike. Um, if you could, uh, if you could tell us a bit more about the the hydro projects that you two are working on, um, I know you have some slides to share. So we'll, uh, I guess, uh, Mike, would you like to go first? Sure, you bet. Let me uh, share screens real quick. All right, you guys share seeing that? Good deal. And if you see the side of my head, it's just because I'm looking at a, a different monitor. So, so my apologies there. Um, so the, the Grant Lake Hydroelectric uh, project um, will be on Grant Lake and Grant Creek. Um, it's, it's located uh, near the, the community of, of Moose Pass on the, the Seward Highway. So, so basically here's this the dog leg shift uh, Lake here, we've got about a mile of creek where Grant Creek dumps into the narrows between um, upper and lower trail lakes. Um, directly north uh, here would be Anchorage, directly south would be Seward, and this is kind of the, the town of, of Moose Pass in, in this area. Um, just a couple of pictures here of, of the, the area here. This would be looking north. Um, this one's actually looking east. And then um, this one would be looking back west down this area. So the project as a, as a whole, um, it, it doesn't have a dam on it, really just has a, a small bypass weir here, which controls the flow um, out of the lake into this bypass area to put in the required bypass flows. The water will go through an intake structure into a 10 foot horseshoe, um, uh, style tunnel. Uh, it'll be about a 1% grade all the way down to um, this area here where it'll transition to a 15% a grade. Uh, the water will exit the, the tunnel at a rock face into a six foot steel penstock um, where it runs down into the powerhouse and bifurcates into two four foot uh, uh, pipes that go into two 2.5 megawatt Francis turbines. And then the water um, exits that in the tail race and back into Grant Creek, which is um, really the, the viable habitat of the project. It exists here just outside of the canyon reach. It's, it's kind of hard to tell, but, but you can't tell from the, the photo here, this is a very narrow um, rock walled canyon. And this is where it, it opens up and, and becomes graded. The project has um, uh, really uh, uh, about one mile of transmission line and two miles of access road. That's some, you know, one of the things that, that you have to look for, especially on these, these small projects, is its proximity to uh, existing infrastructure. 
at a million dollars a mile for transmission line, it doesn't take a, you know, a project being very far away from existing uh, transmission for it to become quickly an, an ineconomical project. So that's, that's one of the things that you look for in, in developing these projects. So that's a, a quick introduction on, on Grant Creek. Thank you. And uh, I guess, uh, Joel, you said you had some slides as well. Uh, I do. Let me see if I can successfully share a screen here. And I have the same problem looking at a different monitor, so you can look at the side of my head for a while now. Uh, let's see here. This one. Uh, yeah, so uh, Joel Groves with uh, Polar Consult Alaska. Uh, we are a uh, engineering consulting firm based out of Anchorage. We do a lot of hydropower work across the state. Uh, map there, the dots are all of the projects we or all the communities we've done work in. Uh, not exclusively hydro, but just uh, just the general hydro would be sort of the general the, the southern arc of the state there. Um, I guess I'll jump forward to Fishhook Creek because we're talking about the project. So this is Fishhook Creek up in Hatcher Pass. Um, the concept here is this is a run of river hydro project. So there's no appreciable storage on this one. Um, we would be diverting, um, let's see if I still have a cursor. I do, look at that. Uh, we would be diverting water out of the creek um, up here at the intake. Um, if you're familiar with Hatcher Pass, this is basically across the road and down the hill from the 16 mile, uh, sort of the, the so-called snow machine parking lot. Um, put that water into a 24 inch diameter pipe, um, send it down the mountainside to the intersection of the blue line and the red line. Um, that's where the powerhouse would be. Um, would have either uh, one or two Pelton turbines, uh, two jet uh, impulse machines that would generate about two megawatts uh, full output. Um, then they'd connect into a, about a half mile power line extension that would connect into the existing MEA distribution system at the Ski Talk or in the vicinity of the, the new Ski Talk uh, ski resort down there. Um, as Mike said, um, you know, proximity to infrastructure is always a key thing with the uh, project viability. Um, on this one, we have the benefit of existing roads and existing power lines in proximity to the project that helps control project cost. Um, so runner river projects, um, this project, if we look at the, I can be so bold as to move to the next slide. Um, these projects have seasonable output that uh, follows the uh, flow of the creek. This is not a hydrograph for Fishhook Creek, but it's basically the same, um, same principle. Um, during the summer months, you get reliable full output. Um, that is basically firm capacity. You can, you can bank on that, that power being there you know, a year ahead of time you know, or years ahead of time, whatever. So it's fully dispatchable. Um, in the wintertime, you, you know, as, as everything freezes up, you basically get a sort of a groundwater discharge phenomenon that sustains water flow in the creek at a reduced um, but fairly reliable rate. Um, as you can see here, year to year, you have that same winter recession. It's pretty reliable and repeatable from year to year. And so even though you can't depend on the full installed capacity of the project, you will still have some, some fraction of the project output that, that remains throughout the winter months. Um, and it continues to decline until just before breakup. Uh, so in the April, April, May timeframe, depending on where you're at, at which point the onset of uh, breakup uh, brings you back to full flow and full output. Um, so that's the, the general overview of Fishhook. Uh, it's been in the works since 2005. Um, the project uh, now has its learner's permit and it's just steadily learning how to drive at a 15 year old uh, wannabe project. Um, it's had a lot of um, barriers with the state uh, it's on state land and we've been waiting for uh, DNR to issue state leases for many, many years going on decades now. But uh, if that ever happens, it'll be a great project for the rail belt. This, this project on an annualized basis will provide about 1% of the energy to Mad News Electric Association. Uh, and I'll uh, turn it back to Ben. Great, thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, so you, uh, both of you mentioned uh, transmission as a constraint on, on where, where viable hydro projects can be located. And I know, uh, at least in Grant Lake's case, uh, there were a lot of other uh, candidate projects that got ruled out. So, what are what are some of the what are some of the constraints on on where viable hydro can be built, and uh, what are the what are the general features of a good site? Well, um, you know, really, when when we look at these, let, let's then maybe take a step back and and 
you know, when we look at, at hydro feasibility, um, you look at, at four main areas and, and, and that, that's really um, the hydropower potential of the area. So that'd be, um, that, that would include, you know, the watershed, the site hydrology, the energy potential and, and the timing of, of that en energy as, as Joel mentioned. And then, you know, the other, one of the other things that you would consider is, is what, what we would say is, is a regulatory analysis. And in that would look at, at the land status. Is it, is it on wilderness land? Can, it, can you even, um, you know, build in, you know, a potential project in that? You'd look at terrestrial um, issues, you know, endangered species, salmon, endangered plants, any, any of that sort of thing. Um, cultural resources, recreational resources, you'd look at, you'd look at all of those things. And then also part of that analysis would, would then, you know, you'd, you'd generate a, a, a cost estimate for the project um, and, and see how much you, you know, at first you think it's going to, it's going to cost. And then out of that, you can run a financial analysis. Hey, what's, what's your, what's your cost of power going to be? And so, you know, for, for any hydro project or potential project, we would do one of these desktop feasibility analysis. So, so for example, for, for Grant Lake, we, we actually did um, desktop as, as well as a, a little bit of ground reconnaissance on, on four project sites. So that was uh, Crescent Lake, uh, uh, Ptarmigan Lake, Falls Creek, and of course, uh, Grant Lake. And after you know doing the evaluation and, and going through that stuff, um, you know Grant Lake came out to be the, the the most feasible project. So, you know you you have to look at at all of those things, and um, you know so cost is certainly one of those things. And um, if if you are close to existing transmission, existing roads, um, that sort of thing, then that's gonna that's gonna save you. Um, a lot of money and, and make these smaller projects um, more viable. You know, if, if not, if you have to run 80 miles of, of uh, transmission line, well, then you have to have a project the size of Susit and Watana to make it even start to pencil off. Anything you'd like to add, Joel? Uh, well, I think Mike pretty much nailed it. I guess you know, run a bridge. You know, so so Mike has a storage project he's talking about. Run a river is is substantially similar. You have to run through all the same issues. I guess the only the only nuance um, is is you know some some of the resource the potential resource impacts do differ. Uh, run a river does not you know because it lacks that storage capacity. Um, it it has no or very limited potential to affect uh, the downstream hydrology of the river or the you know whatever the receiving bodies are. Um, so there's there's generally a lesser environmental impact there, um, and of course I have to say that with a with a huge caveat. Every every you know the environmental impact of every hydro resource um, is 100% site specific, and you can have uh, stored very benign you know environmentally benign storage projects. You can have very environmentally devastating run of river projects. Um, so you really have to analyze these projects on a case by case basis. They're very site specific um, to the to the specific location you're at, the specific resources that you're um, that you're interfacing with. Um, but just there is that general presumption or that that general reality that run of river does not generally change the downstream flow regime. So there's one one thing you don't have to worry about quite as much with those. Obviously, you don't have the storage, which is a huge benefit. So there's always pros and cons. And can you define run of river? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so run of river. Um, is, is like I described with Fishhook, it, it's, a, it's a project that does not have a dam and does not have any appreciable storage capacity at that intake site where it's pulling water out of the environment. Um, it, it simply, um, you know, pulls the instant, some, some or all of the instantaneous flow of a creek or river out, um, runs it through the project and then puts it back into the, into the, into the basin or into the drainage um, downstream of the, of the powerhouse. Um, so it only uses, um, you know, the available flow in the creek up to its design capacity. It can't store any of the water. It doesn't. So it, it doesn't change the downstream flow regime at all. It, it obviously does change the flow regime in the bypass reach, the, the part of the creek between the intake and the powerhouse. Um, but downstream and upstream, up upstream, there's no, there's no impact. Okay. Oh, ben, do you want to... oh, I'm sorry, Ben. Let me let me ask okay. you that real quick, if if you don't mind. There's really a spectrum, um, even when you have storage, like, like Grant Lake is using 
the natural lake and just drawing it down from um, normal high water mark on down. But then, you, you know, it, it, it's really a spectrum from a very large dam to even just, you know, a smaller impoundment to kind of um, capture some of the water, but it's still very seasonal, just like a, a run a river project would be. So it's, it's really not just storage or run a river. There's, there's really quite a spectrum and it depends upon, you know, what your existing resource is and, and maybe how big of a dam um, you, you would want to, you'd want to put on there. And that's this giant balancing act of, of when the energy is available or when the water is available and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and uh, the general the general theme of this presentation is uh, uh, sort of compensating for variable renewables. Uh, generally speaking, how good is hydro at, at doing that? Can it can it ramp fast enough? Um, and I see there's I see there's been a bit of a side conversation about this going on in the chat. But uh, do, do, does hydro does hydro have a role in uh, in balancing variable renewables? Yeah, so I, I did kind of see that that. Side dialogue sounds pretty cool. David Thomas and some others are, are having a great di dialogue there, um, and so so hydro will generally, well, so I guess I guess we go back to the run of river versus storage. So run of river, unless you have some sort of you know auxiliary storage technology, is a use it or lose it phenomenon. It can't really regulate um, other other resources. Um, storage can with with the, with the key preface that hydros kind of move slowly, so they they move on the order of a sec of, of um, seconds. Which, depending on what um, what you're trying to to manage or you know control, may or may not be fast enough. Um, you know, I think there's hopefully there's going to be some discussion of battery technologies. Batteries have have a much faster response time, and they they can mitigate you know for wind or solar or whatever. Hydros, it's like yeah, not not they're not not the ideal tool for them. Not, I don't know if um, HEA may have um, some Mike or uh, Michael or others may have um, a more nuanced answer there. So, uh, you know, basically, um, Joel, Joel's correct that um, hydro can certainly um, follow certain variable renewables. For example, um, solar, solar power, right? At night when you don't have solar power, you can schedule a hydro um, in at night to cover that, that uh, dip in, in energy. Same sort of thing, if you have a long-term forecast for the wind, and you're not seeing any wind, well, then the hydro can follow that. Or conversely, you can ramp back your hydro and, and utilize the wind during that time frame. But where hydro um, is not able to follow is like wind from minute to minute. It, they just simply don't have the, the ramp rates. They're, they're big, slower machines. They don't have the, the ramp rate to be able to follow the minute by minute differences when a, when a cloud suddenly comes over the sun or the wind suddenly drops off or, or picks up. In, in that instance, then you either do need a battery or you need um, you know, a, a fast um, fossil, um, you know, like a, a aero derivative following that energy in, in order to, to respond to the, the minute by minute stuff. Well, uh, since we're since we've been talking mostly about run of river projects, uh, how do how do these projects uh, change the ecology and the hydrology of the areas where they are? Um, we've we've sort of touched on this a little bit, but uh, um, how do they how do they sort of change the streams they're attached to, and what are the effects of that over over a long period of time? Hydro projects. Uh, I know there are, there are a few hundred year old hydro projects. In Alaska, um, what kind of what kind of effects are possible over that over that period of time? Um, well, I guess I can jump in, and, and like I sort of alluded to earlier, it's um, it's entirely a project specific question. Um, they can be totally benign; they can they can enhance resources, um, or they, they can destroy resources. Um, you know, so it's 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 entirely in how you design and operate the project, um, how it gets permitted, and so on. Um, you know, I mean. Uh, Aklutna and you know the original Aklutna project that was put in in 1915 was a was a fantastic boon for the city of Anchorage. It also destroyed a, a salmon run on the Aklutna River. So there's pros and cons there. And of course the the current Aklutna project uh, 
kind of continued that legacy with a, with a much larger and, and different configuration, but with a, a similar impact. Um, you know, there's a bad example. Um, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll grasp at the, the Dewey Lake projects in Skagway or Goat Lake projects in Skagway as examples of, um, uh, there we go. Yeah, Skagway is for, for, for permit number two or four. There's, there's some gold rush era hydro projects in Skagway that have been in operation for, um, you know, decades. And, and approaching a, sec a century if they haven't exceeded them. And those are benign, you know, they're, they're high lake, uh, alpine lakes that come down to a uh, creek and, you know, there's, there's no real environmental impact with those that I'm aware of. Um, if anything, and, and often, often the case with that kind of project is, is you know, the, the project access corridors become uh, recreational trails and, you know, those become a huge benefit to the community. And that, that's a, a, you know, generally true potential for any of these projects, depending on where they're at and how they're, how they're conceived. Um, so it's a very broad answer to the question. And I would kind of um, echo what, what uh, Joel said there. It, it is project specific, but, but they're also, you know, we're, we're becoming smarter and smarter. Um, they just, they don't let us develop projects like the, the hundred year old Akutna project that would wipe out a, a, a salmon stream. And, and so they're actually, um, Obviously, there are impacts with with anything you you build, but there are potentials to to actually enhance the systems. For example, on on Grant Creek, one thing that that the project, the Grant Lake project, will do is it will actually elevate winter flows. So so the the flows on on Grant Creek um, in the winter time can be as low as as say 15 to 20 cfs. So you know, I, I don't know if you can remember that slide where it showed all the where where the 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 creek braids and that sort of thing, but but that area dries up and and any eggs that were uh, salmon eggs were, that were laid in that area um, can can desiccate and freeze and that sort of thing. So the project will actually keep um, a minimum of 52 cfs in that project all winter long. So what that does is it it actually enhances the the winter habitat, and and on the on the other side of things, too much water can be bad for a system too. If you get these huge storm events where where you take a a system that normally runs at say 200 to 500 cfs, and all of a sudden you see 2200 cfs of of flow through that system it'll blow out the, the habitat on the, on the side of the creek, um, may open up channels where uh, that, that salmon will spawn in and then it later dries up and, and leaves those, those fish stranded. So a project like Grant Creek will actually mitigate those. So it moves the lower end up and the higher end down kind of thing. Um, and, and you can do designs. Um, uh, Another example from Grant Creek, mostly because Grant Lake, Grant Creek, because that's what I'm familiar with is, you know, certainly temperature is a, is a concern in, in the project. And so the project is designed with a, uh, an intake structure that can take water out of um, variable columns in, in Grant Lake. So we can actually match the, the water temperature to what exists um, naturally. Um, without without the project, so you know we can pull water from lower down for cooler water, or more toward the surface for warmer water, or or vice versa in in the winter. So so we actually have a bit of a of an ability to adjust temperature on the project. Um, I know, uh, for example, um, uh, Bradley Lake, um, they you know follow up studies have shown that that it it's actually. Um, enhanced some of the the fisheries on on that project, so so the you know certainly can be impactful, um, but with the rigorous licensing process nowadays, um, you know generally speaking, um, we're getting better and better at at, at building these things and and minimizing um, those impacts. Well, uh, since we've brought up the licensing process. Uh, We've we've seen that uh, hydro projects do not tend to move fast. Um, uh, Joel, you you mentioned uh, uh, your your project's been been in the works since two thousand five, and I think uh, Grant Lake, um, I think took took about a decade to get its uh, uh, to get its FERC permits. 
Um, do you think, do you think that, uh, 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 the current permitting process kind of places, places the right emphasis on, on, uh, what, uh, uh, what it looks at, um, what it requires and, uh, in the value of these hydro projects? Uh, I'll jump in there, I guess, and, and then Joel, I'll let Joel follow up. <laughs> It is a uh, the FERC licensing process is draconian. It it is it is a, a, a very difficult um, process, and and it's really tough for these smaller projects in particular. Um, you know, FERC really doesn't make a, a distinction whether you're licensing a, a five megawatt hydro, five hundred kilowatt pop project, or uh, a 500 megawatt project. And so, um, you know, while on a bigger system, um, you know, you, you're likely to have to, to study a, a larger area, but the number of studies don't, don't change all, all that much. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very um, long process, a very rigorous process and, and a very costly process. And um, it, you know, you really have to have the, the backing and the fortitude of, a, of an organization that's, that's willing to see that through, um, you know, for the long haul um, kind of thing. With that said, um, we certainly want to develop um, projects that, that have the rigor um, and, and environment, you know, do, do projects that, that study all of, all of the impacts associated with with these, these projects. I, I would say that I think, you know, there are certainly efficiencies in, in hydro reform is one of the things that, that uh, the National Hydro Association is, is advocating for. Um, you know, one thing personally, I think um, I, I would like to see is that, I, I would actually like to see FERC have primacy on, on these um, licensing projects that, that have FERC jurisdiction. Um, one, one of the things they have is what's, what's called um, 4E mandatory conditioning authority. And so um, for instance, the, the US Forest Service, if it's on US Forest Service land would have 4E mandatory conditioning authority. Um, the US Fish and Wildlife has 4E mandatory um, conditioning authority. And, you know, oftentimes the, that those agencies are not a hundred, and, and there are other agencies, but um, they, they will not agree with FERC and they'll ask for things above and beyond what um, FERC is generally requiring in, in an EIS or, or that sort of thing. So, so for example, um, in our permit, um, FERC, FERC required, and, and don't quote me on this, but let, let's say um, seven or eight uh, project plans. But the US Forest Service required a total of 14 plans. And so they, since they had mandatory conditioning authority, even though FERC found that those additional plans were not necessarily, were not necessary, they had no authority to, to do anything about it. And, and for example, if the US Forest Service in a 4E mandatory conditioning authority had said, build a school in Fairbanks, that would have been, that FERC could have done nothing about that, that, that uh, mandatory conditioning. And, and if we wanted to advance that project, we would have had to build a school in, in Fairbanks. And, and surprisingly, you see some pretty outrageous conditions. Not on ours, um, not on the Grant Lake project, but um, you know the, that that sort of thing can happen. So, so that's one thing I think that um, you know maybe hydro reform. If if we had a single government agency, be that FERC or whomever, um, that that had full authority over it. The other thing I'd like to I'd like to see is 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 taking advantage of of technology a little better and existing data. Um, you know, we go out there and spend years and years studying stuff that we already pretty much knew all about just by extrapolating from existing data. So, um, you know, that, that, that uh, by using existing information and technology, that, that saves everybody time and money. 
kind of long-winded. Sorry, Joel, why don't you jump in there and add it? Yeah, no, so I will um, 100 and a million percent concur that, that FERC is a um, extremely exhausting one-size-fits-all process. And if you're a small project, um, it will eat you alive. Um, and then it will just keep on going and, until there's nothing left. It's, it's horrifying. Um, but it's necessary. I mean, it's, uh, or not necessary, but, you know, it's, it, it's built, built on the National Environmental Policy Act and all the other federal requirements. So it, it's kind of baked into a lot of things that are really hard to change politically. Um, yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll touch a little bit on the non-FERC project um, or non-FERC process. So many projects in Alaska are not under FERC jurisdiction. Um, there's a handful of um, criteria that put you into FERC jurisdiction. And oftentimes up here, you, you do not meet those criteria and you're not a FERC project. Uh, Grant Lake is, is a FERC project because it's on federal land within the True Gutch, uh, National Forest, I presume. Um, you know, but, but often, I mean, so I will, um, as an entrepreneur, I avoid FERC jurisdiction. And to the extent I can, I tell my clients to avoid first FERC jurisdiction. Um, you know, this is talk, generally talking about like re uh, remote Alaska communities and so on, looking for hydropower for their own little diesel electric grids. Um, and so, so the non, non FERC process is generally a lot better. Um, you don't have the, the rigor and the exhaustive studies of, of everything under the sun and ab above the sun and behind the sun and near the sun that, that FERC requires. Um, so they tend to be, they tend to be quicker. Uh, they tend to be less expensive and, and you still have, I think the same rigor for, you know, the environmental issues that matter. Um, so it's, it's a good process. There, there are, you know, there are still issues. I had a project out in Southwest Alaska in the Bristol Bay watershed, you know, home of the, you know, tens of millions of, uh, of sockeyes that come back every year. Um, that was, was, it was a run of river project in, in sockeye habitat. Um, and so we worked with fish and game over the course of, I think, four or five years, um, trying to assess the impacts of the project, you know, the bypass reach on, on um, you know, incubating sockeye eggs. And it, exactly like um, um, uh, Michael uh, spoke to a few minutes ago, the, in the natural flow regime of the creek, most of the eggs that were, that were um, or the reds that were laid out in this reach every year would, uh, would dewater and dry out and freeze. Um, so there's very little productive habitat up there. And we eventually got, you know, reached that conclusion with fish and game. That's like, yeah, you can operate this project and all the productive salmon habitat is downstream and there's, there's negligible impact. Um, but it took us several years and, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars of uh, iterative studies to get there. It's like, you know, you'd go out there and say, well, what about this site? Okay, we think we understand that. Hey, there's another site over there. Let's go look at that one. And of course, you know, these are all season specific. So you have to wait a year, go look at that site during, you know, certain flow regimes and, and times of the year. And then that happened several times. Um, you know, and so is, is there a way to, you know, and this is while, well, you know, the community continues on diesel fuel and, you know, the, the project benefits all get pushed down the road. Um, is there a way to streamline that? Well, it, it's always challenging because, you know, the, it, like I said earlier, it's all site specific. Um, you know, you don't want to harm these resources. You want to have, you know, synergistic developments. Um, and sometimes it just takes time to figure that stuff out. Um, but so, you know, high level uh, non-jurisdictional non projects uh, tend to be a lot quicker. Um, I've seen projects where the stars align that, that move from, okay, we're going to do this to we've done it in as little as three years. Uh, and the one that uh, just happened this past year, uh, Juniper Creek and Eagle River, I think once, once that decision was made, I think in like 2017 or 2018, that project, you know, was commissioned this year. So maybe, maybe it's four years. Um, of course, there were, there were several years before that when the, you know, they were doing hydrology studies and trying to figure out the, the business case for the project um, that predated that decision. But once they made that decision to go, start the permitting process, start the design process, um, and get through construction and everything, it happened for, fairly quickly. Um, so it is possible, uh, certainly not on every project, but on some projects you can be reasonably um, expedient, I guess, in the, in the hydropower ex sense of expedient. So. Well, uh, let's talk about IPPs. Uh, Joel, you're an a independent power producer. Um, you're hoping to sell power as a third party to MEA. Um, and uh, uh, you're also, I believe, with the, uh, with the Alaska uh, Independent Power Producer Association, uh, working, working with other small hydro IPPs. Um, about how many small hydro IPPs are, are out there and uh, uh, what what role do they play in bringing power to the rail belt? And uh, I guess the second part of this question, um, you've you've also uh, written that uh, that uh, power contract price structures uh, don't really 
value Hydra the way you think they, they should? Uh, what value do you think they fail to leave out? And, uh, and for Mike, uh, from, from the utilities perspective, what, uh, what purpose does the, does the present pricing structure for IPPs uh, serve? So I guess, I guess we'll start with you, Joel. Um, um, yeah, so I will uh, try and be clever here and share my screen again. Um, so there are currently three hydro, there are three IPP hydro projects on the rail belt, um, which is not very many. And so this is, um, this is a pre-existing graphic that I already had. So this is Anchorage in the Matsu Valley. Um, and so the, the blue areas are the drainage basins associated with the, the three um, IPP hydro projects that exist on the rail belt today. Uh, McRoberts Creek up uh, just e uh, east of Palmer there, that, that project is actually defunct right now, but that's a 100 kilowatt project that went in in 1991. Uh, South Fork Eagle River, uh, closest to Anchorage, it's a 1.1 megawatt Renner River project that was commissioned in 2013. And then uh, the one that I mentioned earlier, Juniper Creek is a 300 kilowatt um, Run River project that just came online this summer um, in 2021. And just for reference, the uh, drainage basin for, uh, for the Eklutna project, uh, for the 40 megawatt 1955 Eklutna project is also shown in gray. Um, and so to my knowledge, there, there could be other uh, projects I'm not aware of, but these are the three um, existing IPP hydros on the rail belt. Um, so this represents, you know, from 1991 to, uh, you know, to today, this represents some 35 years of development or whatever that math, maybe that's 40 years now, I don't know, whatever that math works out to. Um, and this is everything that's come online in that time. Um, so, you know, compared to the resource potential, it's, it's not very much uh, compared to the overall generation, it's not very much. And the bottom line is this is kind of a, an interesting footnote in, in, the, uh, in the overall uh, energy picture of the rail belt. Um, the, the problem with all three of these projects is these are projects where exceptional people crossed with exceptional circumstance, and they were able to navigate all of the barriers to make a project happen. Um, the business model that these people pioneered is not something that replicates to, to you know, significant future development in the rail belt. Um, and, and that's where we get into the, um, you know, the issue of the, the power sales contracting is, is the, the the biggest barrier is simply a lack of, um, you know, appropriate revenue to support the projects and to, you know, encourage the private sector to come in and try and develop these resources. Um, so the the current price paradigm <coughs> for IPPs in general is is predicated on the, the notion of avoided cost, um, which is is at a very high level, basically to say the cost that the the, the value that these projects bring to the grid is the cost that the utility avoids by not having to run its own turbines or its own, its own generation. So basically, and, and you know, at, at a simple sense, that, that's basically the avoided cost of fuel. You, know, you turn off a gas turbine or you throttle back a gas turbine, you're burning less gas, you're, you're having to buy less gas. Um, there's other stuff that goes into it, avoided O&M. Um, in the lower 48, you often have a capacity value. That's not something that's ever been, um, been available to IPPs up here for a variety of reasons. Um, so, so that is the, you know, so that avoided cost principle is sort of the price paradigm um, that IPPs live within. That, that's, that's our gross revenue is that avoided cost, however you define that. Um, and so there, there's a bunch of, of legacy problems um, with avoided cost in Alaska and on the rail belt that do not exist in the lower 48. Um, and as a result, um, in the lower 48, roughly half, and it varies by you know, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but roughly half of the total power generated comes from IPPs today. Um, in Alaska, I don't even know what the number is, but it probably rounds to zero just because it's a very small fraction. Um, and so, and you know, the, the root cause of that problem is because IPPs do not have access to that market. And, and the, the definition of avoided cost is, in Alaska is, is obsolete and arcane compared to how it's been implemented in the lower 48 for many years. Um, and so at a very high level, it's um, the way avoided cost is calculated. Um, currently the utilities publish their avoided cost. Um, the RCA doesn't have the resources to audit those. So there's no independent audit that those are correct. Um, like I mentioned, the, the capacity value, which is basically the sort of the, the capital cost of the generation equipment um, does not get any value for, for IPPs. Um, in the lower 48, uh, all of these renewable technologies do get capacity value, uh, wind, solar, hydro. 
Um, you know, environmental attributes today, um, many of the rail built utilities are actually mandating has a, has a um, you know, a precondition for contracting with an IPP, but they will receive the environmental attributes of the project and any value that that has without any compensation. Um, so that denies the IPP the ability to independently market their, their renewable attributes on the, on the third party markets and, you know, obtain additional revenue there. Um, and there's also, um, I guess the other key thing is a levelized cost of energy. When you look at Bradley, when Bradley was commissioned in the early 1990s, the cost of power from Bradley was twice the avoided cost of energy at the time. Bradley is roughly four cents. The avoided cost of energy from gas at the time was about two cents. And so the rail belt utilities recognized that, you know, there was value there over the long term. It's a, you know, a many decade, many, many century life project that in the long term would, would be a good economic prospect. Um, and today, you know, 30 years later, sure enough, Bradley's, you know, half the cost of, of um, natural gas fired energy. Um, the exact same thing is true of, you know, IPP hydros, but to date, um, there's been very few, very little precedent, if any, for, you know, utilities acknowledging that and making that same business case and making that same decision. Um, that did happen with phase one of Fire Island Wind, uh, where Chugach paid a premium, and today it's basically cost neutral, and in the future it'll presumably get cheaper. Um, but as a general rule, utilities are currently running on the principle of, you know, quarter by quarter avoided cost is, is what an IPP can expect to earn. And, uh, you know, that, that forces the IPP to cover that very high upfront cost, especially with hydro. It's a uniquely high, high capital um, technology and, you know, defer the, defer the savings off to future, you know, future decades. And it makes a very difficult business case for IPPs. So the sort of a, a uh, very long-winded answer, but those are sort of the barriers, um, economic barriers to IPPs today. Well, Mike, looking at this, some of those will be pro provocative, so we'll we'll see what the responses become. Yeah. Well, looking at this from the other end, Mike, uh, what's what's the value of this avoiding cost methodology for utilities? Yeah. So, so I mean, Joel, Joel is basically correct. That, you know, IPPs basically have to come in at, at or below that that uh, avoided cost and. Um, you know, really, it, it, it is a, a one size fits all shoe. Um, so, so, you know, we're, we're regulated by um, the, the, the RCA. And, you know, we, we really on an on an IPP, we can't, we can't really make a, a, a distinction between, you know, an IPP selling power for, for wind or solar or hydro. Oh, Although you know it is it is contract specific and and certainly that those are those are negotiable, but um, you know really that threshold is the is the uh, the avoided cost of power. Um, you know one one area I, I do disagree a little bit with Joel is that it, it is transparent. We're we're um, you know pretty much everybody on the rail belt are uh, we are all cooperatives. We file that COPA information on a on a quarterly basis. It, I mean, all of the calculations, all of the actual costs that go into those things are are available to anybody who wants to to, to take a look at it. But um, it is challenging. It's it's challenging for hydro, um, as Joel mentioned. It it's a, a very expensive upfront asset, but also as we've mentioned, you know, hydro can last a hundred years, may, maybe longer, right? I mean. We're, we're licensing, we're relicensing projects that are 100 years old, and we really haven't had commercial electricity for all that much longer than than 100 years. And so, on the, there there are some disconnects for for those things, and and I think you know it's it, it's appropriate to try and and put those things on a on an apples to apples basis, but it's 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 really difficult to do. Um, you know, the one thing I would I would say that that would would help hydro and and help IPPs and and potentially help um, cooperatives is if is if hydro were treated equivalent to other renewables. For example, um, uh, wind and solar are are both um, eligible for um, either investment tax credits or production tax credits. Hydro, not so much, right? There's there's a thirty percent haircut right there um, on projects, and so, um, you know, I think it, it would be important to put all of all of the renewable energy stuff on an even playing field, not just hydro, um, but but geothermal or tidal 
um, they should all have the same benefits that, that uh, wind and, and solar have. Well, thank you. And uh, since we mentioned Juniper Creek earlier, I'll point out that uh, uh, David Braley, uh, the builder of that project is, is in the audience with us. So thanks, thanks for coming, David. And uh, we're opening it up to uh, audience questions now. Uh, so David, feel free to jump in with your experience if uh, you want to answer anything. But uh, for audience questions, I saw uh, Mike, Mike Kraft, uh, you had your hand up forever. Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Two things to add. Uh, one of them was earlier in your conversation with respect to uh, how, how to pair wind with, uh, with hydro. And I just want to make sure that you know, I currently operate a wind farm I have for about 12 years now. And one of the tools that we can use as a wind uh, provider is to uh, basically curtail the turbines. So we can control, uh, curtail them on the uh, up ramp and the down ramp. And so there would be opportunities to pair the output of wind with the ability of hydro to respond to it. Um, that's definitely possible. And then one of the other things I would like to comment on is you guys are talking about the avoided cost. Uh, calculations. And one of the other tools that uh, has certainly been used against wind is regulation cost. And those have been uh, more of a detriment than any other aspect of that formula, uh, because it can be construed to be very, very high. And it's very difficult to, uh, to go up against that, uh, those calculations, unless you spend a lot of money, a lot of time. And even then, it may not, may not pay off. So just wanted to say those two things and appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, we're running a bit behind. So uh, we'll, take, we'll take one more question from the audience at this point. Uh, we'll have more opportunity for questions later. Um, does anybody have anything you'd like to ask? All right, then we'll uh, jump straight from uh, hydro to pumped hydro storage. Um, which uh, we have uh, Hig here. Um, a, uh, he's a geologist and a remote sensing specialist. You've, uh, um, you might know him if you've been to other installments of this, of this series. Um, and uh, you've, you've worked on pumped hydro uh, with, uh, I, think, I think you were you were a consultant with uh, a report uh, to the state about that. So um, if you'd like to take it away. <laughs> yeah, is that, is that no? I, I did I describe yeah, that correctly? I, I, yeah, I, I can't claim uh, nearly the the, uh, the the knowledge level that uh, many people are coming in here with. But I, I'm I'm and I'm partly I'm uh, filling in for Ke Kerry Williams, who's spent a lot of time thinking about this, but couldn't make it tonight. Um, but I'll I'd like to I'll, I'll put a little bit out there anyway, hopefully to uh, maybe stimulate a little discussion, provide a little background. Um, uh, if someone can give me uh, screen share privs, then I do have a few slides there. All right, you should um, you should be able to share now. All right. Yep. Let's see here. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah. First of all, pumped hydro. Uh, people use a bunch of different words, so I just was going to list those here at the start and to avoid any confusion there. Um, and I, I presented, some of you saw my initial uh, presentation at the beginning of this whole series. Um, I'd be um, happy to point you to the recording of that. And I'm, but I'm gonna repeat a little bit of what I talked about there. And the, the point was basically to talk about how do we store energy in the United States? So I start out with this, uh, this blank uh, pie chart here. And so the question is like, what, what are the different things that we use to storage, store uh, power in the United States? We can first take a look at lithium batteries, which are, you know, like the like uh, the best. It's about 0.6 percent, I believe, if I recall correctly. Um, a very very small piece of this pie. If you add all the other batteries together, then they they bring that up to a couple percent. Um, but that leaves a lot of pie missing, and it turns out the rest of that is pumped hydro. And so this is the technology that's predominantly been used uh, for storage. Uh, for dedicated storage. Now that's a little different than the storage component of, uh, of a hydropower generation facility like what we're talking about with Grant Lake. That's an absolutely critical part of, of understanding this more broadly. But as far as facilities that are built exclusively, uh, exclusively for the purpose of storage, um, dominantly what has been done historically all the way back to the first ones are in the 30s 
is uh, pump storage hydroelectricity. And so what is it? Um, you start off with a mountain next to some water. Um, you, uh, you make a reservoir, usually you have to make it up on top. You might potentially take care of a take advantage of a natural one. You might even have to make the lower reservoir, but you want a lot of relief between those. And you connect the two um, with, a, with a pipe. Um, and then you put a, a turbine on that. And, and so in this way, it's very much like a, a hydroelectric turbine, except this typically the way this is done is with a turbine that can also be reversed and used as a pump. Um, and so that's the key distinction there. Um, if you have excess electricity on the grid, you can actually run this turbine in reverse and push water uphill, filling the upper reservoir and storing the gravitational potential energy associated with that. And of course, you also have to connect it with transmission. Um, and so this, the reason this comes up as um, a, a sort of a, a somewhat separate conversation from conventional hydro, uh, there is definitely, you know, some overlap. You could potentially even look at conventional overlap having, or sorry, a, a conventional hydro having a um, having a component of pumped hydro. You could that that could be that you can mix and match to some extent. But um, this is um, at the extreme can actually be a closed system. So you could actually have a lower reservoir that was just a sealed basin. Uh, it's not quite closed because there's evaporation and rain, but um, you could actually have these two uh, operating, sending water back and forth between the two and it could serve its storage uh, function. Um, and that means it opens up a whole different set of options in terms of siting. And, um, as Joel was talking about, uh, you know, and, and, and Mike, like the siting for hydroelectricity is tremendously complex. Um, and I think this is one thing that's really relevant in trying to understand uh, the potential role of pump, pump storage hydroelectricity is that you can site it in more places. You still need relief. You still need access to water. It's not like you can just put it anywhere you want, but it is a more flexible, um, a flexible thing. Um, and it can provide that, that long-term storage element. I also wanted to note one uh, kind of key distinction between this and uh, a lithium battery or other, other conventional battery. Um, uh, if you are making something that's storing uh, a similar amount of electricity as HEA's BESS, and you're making a pumped storage thing, it's probably not gonna pencil out. It's uh, probably more expensive, at least as expensive. Um, even in your best best case scenario. Um, however, uh, the, the expensive part here is to have the turbine and the connection. Um, if you have the right geometry so that your upper upper dam can, can impound more water, your potential quantity of storage, so the number of, of megawatt hours that you can store in the system can be very, very large. And so when you start talking about storage, storing enough electricity to cover hours, weeks, as you start going out to, you know, or sorry, hours, days, start going out towards weeks and months, that's just totally unrealistic with a conventional battery, but it is realistic with pumped, pumped hydro. And, um, and so this is where this can really start addressing um, a seasonal storage which is somewhat, it's not uniquely a question in Alaska, but it's a bigger question here than it is in most of the United States because we have a more extreme seasonality here. Um, and we also don't have the connectivity into a really wide uh, complex grid with many, many, many generation assets. It's a much more limited world and even more so if you go to, to the rural grids. Um, I wanted to just bring up a couple other points. Um, one is, as I think about it, the way that uh, pumped storage kind of fits into the conversation we're having is really when we talk beyond, about going beyond 50% renewables. If our goal was just to get to 50% renewable, pumped storage, you know, it could be a part of that equation, but there are many ways you can get there. I think, you know, David Thomas and, and Mike Salzetti, they, they have a pretty clear picture in their head already of how they might get HEA to 50% and, and they don't need any pump storage for that. The question when you go beyond 50%, it isn't just the same problem again to get the second 50%. Um, it's when you get to that stage that you really have to start confronting these seasonal storage questions. And there are a number of ways you might achieve this. And I'm just gonna flip through these really quick. Uh, 
Um, but one is to maintain all of our fossil fuel infrastructure. And you essentially need all of it. Um, there isn't really much you can get rid of. And this, there's a study that just came out looking at uh, the potential for 80% renewable electricity that NREL did. And, they, and it shows that even with a number of different scenarios of how you get that, uh, how you get the, the renewable electricity, all of those involve keeping almost all of the fossil fuel infrastructure. And that includes getting the fossil fuels. Oops. All right. Okay. There's that. This is just from that that study. Um, I won't go into the details. Um, another one would be if we got into green energy export. So if we were manufacturing ammonia, hydrogen, kelp ethanol, something like this, we could use that to generate power uh, uh, when we when when the the variable renewables weren't. And so uh, this would be basically where Alaska was a kind of a a passenger on a much larger energy industry, sort of like we are with our uh, fossil fuel economy right now. Um, we could also look at uh, really big uh, baseload pro providers of various sorts. Nuclear, tidal, geothermal could potentially provide, you know, just a huge amount of baseload, and then those variables aren't aren't really as important a part of the story. So we don't have that seasonal storage problem. Um, there's definitely this big hydro possibility. And, and the main one that's been discussed in recent years is Susitna. Um, and one of the things that this NREL study that just came out highlights is that um, it becomes really challenging uh, if you just have one giant hydro project. And it really, I think it was Joel who mentioned that, uh, you know, in order to make a giant hydro project pencil out, it really has to be so big that it's going to dominate the Alaska's rail belt. So if you have just one, then you have to ask the question, what if for some reason that isn't operational? And the way NREL deals, deals with that is they just keep all the fossil fuel infrastructure working. Um, and so then pump storage hydro, that's, that's, that's the, uh, the other one. And so I think that when we're thinking about getting beyond that first 50%, we need to have these options in mind. And I don't think that we should leave pump storage off the table. And I think that there's a lot of value in thinking about how that looks right now, since as we've been talking about tonight, this is a hydro project, it has FERC involved. We can't just whip one of these out of our pocket when we realize it's time that we need them. So is this something we really, I, in my opinion, should be planning ahead for. Um, I'm also just gonna show very briefly um, uh, the project that Carrie has worked on designing some I really don't want to get into all the details as fun as that would be, but it's at a place called Wright Mountain up here um, near our existing in infrastructure. Here's the, here's the road. Um, and so he sketched this out as being a kind of two-part uh, pumped hydro. So it would use this as the lower reservoir. This is the upper reservoir for one pumped hydro system. And then it would actually use the upper reservoir as the lower reservoir for a second uh, um, part of the uh, part of the system. And so these having two pumped hydro systems that are linked like this gives you a little more flexibility and such um, as well as some additional capacity. And this as you know, it, it carry has a method for estimating the costs. And this is um, to build this whole system is pushing up towards a billion dollars, maybe $900 million. It's not a cheap, a cheap facility, but it's big enough that it uh, probably could balance any possible variable renewable future for HEA. It's pretty big um, in terms of the amount of generation and stuff that it can do. It's it, certainly for our current, our current demands. Um, and I think it's worth just, yeah, I wanna put it out there. I wanna say like, this is, you know, there's been some thought put into this. Uh, I'm not saying that this particular prospect is definitely our future, but I really would like to see uh, this conversation about uh, how pumped hydro could be integrated as we go beyond that, that kind of that 50% line, very loosely speaking. Um, I would love to see that continue to be part of the conversation. That's what I've got. Thank you guys. All right, thank you. And uh, since since we are uh, running a bit over, we'll uh, we'll save questions till the very end of the uh, of the of the presentation. Uh, we also uh, have David Thomas here, uh, HEA's director of strategic service, to talk about uh, the uh, the energy storage that we have presently, uh, which is uh, Homer Electric Association's uh, battery battery energy storage system, or uh, or or BESS. Uh, so. Hello, David. Hello. I, I, we 
went back and forth on emails whether Mike and I were presenting tonight. I thought it was all Mike, but I, I'm, I'm happy to wing it. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> so yes, yes, well, we, Mike... we have the largest battery energy storage system for two thousand miles around. Mm -hmm. It's those Tesla Mega Packs, those thirty-seven Tesla Mega Packs there at our Soldatna facility, uh, right on the uh, Sterling Highway, and that gives us. Just a little background. Um, when we are islanded, when we are not electrically connected to Anchorage and Fairbanks, uh, we need to make ourselves whole for any conceivable outcome. If our largest generation suddenly trips offline, we need to keep the lights on for everybody. That's a lot easier when we're interconnected to other utilities because we all carry, it's called spinning reserves. We all carry those reserves for each other's benefit. Uh, so should some other unit trip offline, we have a little extra capacity. And Golden Valley has a little extra capacity. Nanuska and Chugach have a little extra capacity. And you don't notice the hiccup. Things happen and so, you know, the vibration sensor on a turbine trips and it clicks off and you didn't know because the adjacent utilities stepped up and kept the system going. When we're islanded, um, we have to provide our own spin. Um, we have to be ready for any one of our units to trip off. And that has required us to operate three shafts at once, historically, uh, typically Bradley and two combustion shafts. So none of those are running efficiently. Neither of the combustion shafts are using natural gas efficiently uh, when we've dialed them both down. So one of the economics for installing our best was to save that $1,000 an hour of fuel, additional fuel that it costs us when we're islanded. Um, so $1,000 an hour, $25,000 a day. Um, you know, the best would have more than paid for itself in 2019 when we were islanded for so long due to the Swan Lake. Uh, fires. So uh, we put out an RFP request for proposals to uh, various firms for a battery energy storage system to resolve that issue. Multiple firms responded. Uh, everybody met our minimum specification, except for, except for Tesla, who met our minimum 46 megawatt capacity criteria, but instead of providing 46 megawatts for 15 minutes, they would provide it for two hours. They provide, they offered us a, a system that would provide vastly more energy storage and it was a little bit more expensive, but vastly more energy storage. And the HA board at the time opted to go with that uh, bidder, Tesla. Um, because it would both increase our thermal efficiencies at all times, but particularly when we're islanded, but also offered the clearest path to integrating more non-firm renewables, because with that additional energy storage, we could follow um, more non-firm wind, uh, non-firm solar, um, peak shave, valley fill, and keep the system whole uh, through, through the entire year. Um, and it's, it's up, it's going. We, uh, we tested it in numerous ways. Turns out they gave us more battery than the contract called for. Uh, so it, it has even more storage than, than the 93 megawatts they were uh, contracted to provide. Uh, and we tested uh, a third of it at a time. Um, tripped off uh, a generation unit and it jumped in, saved the day, nobody noticed, just like you'd want it to. So that's, that's up and going, operating our system. It is saving us um, fuel now because we're not having to regulate with our thermal units, but we can regulate with our battery. Uh, and in the future, we expect to use it to integrate more non-firm renewables, uh, you know, solar and, and wind. I'll um, stop there and <laughs> look to Ben if you want me to take it that in some other direction. 
Well, uh, one thing, one thing I've been I've been curious about, uh, kind of the kind of the big question of this of this conversation is we have we have all these options for for compensating for variable demand and in variable generation with wind and solar. Um, we have we have gas turbines that we can ramp up and down. Uh, we have we have a battery we can draw from. Uh, we have we have some degree of. Uh, 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 being able to take more or less water out of out of hydro store out of out of out of, out of hydropower reservoirs, uh, so so of these options, is there is there kind of a kind of a ranking in your mind of of uh, which which are the most efficient, which are the most uh, cost effective, um, and uh, in in which which are the best to use as we go to fifty percent renewable and beyond? So. To the extent that we can follow wind and sun with hydro, that's the most efficient. If Bradley operates at one megawatt or 90 megawatts, it is 92% efficient uh, in terms of the theoretical energy in that water versus what, what goes onto the grid. So um, to the extent that you can, um, there are limits on the ramp rates of Bradley. You can't turn it up and down too quickly because you really don't want to break it. You know, it was $315 million in 1991. So that's about $660 million now. Um, so th th there are physical limits on how quickly it can ramp up and down. But within that constraint, and we only have 12% of its capacity, uh, water is the the most efficient thing to vary when you're following wind and solar. But Fire Island demonstrates it doesn't, you can't do that perfectly. Water, Bradley can't follow wind as quickly as wind shifts. So then it's a, a uh, combination of second by second, the battery is, the only thing that can respond within a few cycles, within sixtieths of a second, um, and ultimately, well, at all times, the battery consumes energy. Right, the battery is not an energy producer. If you put seven units of energy in, you get six back. And the more you use the battery, the more energy you consume. Ultimately, that energy at this point comes from gas and from water. And increasingly in our future, that energy will come from gas, water, wind, and sun. Um, but uh, you ultimately have to fill the valleys with gas energy at this point, gas and, and water, uh, while using the battery at, at the very shortest intervals of, of seconds and minutes. Um, as we increase wind and solar input, We'll be using the battery more. We'll be using the battery to shift, shave some peaks and fill some valleys over a few hours interval. But it doesn't, it's the biggest battery for 2,000 miles around, but it'll only, it would only carry our system for an hour or two. We, we can't shift days of energy from Monday to Thursday. Um, we, we can only move it around by a few hours. So um, it'll, It'll be all of the above. Um, water to the extent that we can, because we lose no efficiency. Water behind the dam is 100% as capable of producing energy next month as it was last. Um, at this point, ultimately, the other 86% of our energy comes from gas. So ultimately, we're filling those valleys with gas. But uh, we're providing the regulation. We're we're keeping our th thermal generation in its optimal range by uh, utilizing the battery. Great. Well, um, since we since we are a bit over, I'll, uh, I'll run through my sort of end of presentation stuff before we open the floor to. Uh, sort of free for all audience questions. Uh, can we go back to the slide, Satchel? Yes, just give me one second. Okay. 
Is this where you want to be, Ben? Uh, yeah, number 11. Um, so so one, uh, one quick announcement. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you have, have, have heard of this. Um, there's uh, some, uh, there are two bills in the legislature, House Bill uh, 301 and House Bill 179. Um, uh, the, uh, that would create renewable portfolio standards for the rail belt that uh, kind of ramp up over time. And uh, uh, this is something we'd like to support. Um, as, as we've said, uh, the, the HEA renewable goal um, exists because there are supportive board members, um, pro-renewable board members. And uh, uh, you'll notice looking at these, uh, looking at these, the sort of stair-step renewable goal um, HEA's current plans are to exceed the, the first the first stair step, which is great. Um, but uh, uh, we, uh, as as renewable advocates, we want to uh, uh, support uh, this, this this RPS standard as as kind of a kind of a backstop um, for for renewable progress. Um, it's uh, it's it's great that we can depend on a, on a pro renewable board who supports these kind of things, but. Uh, uh we don't want to make that our, our kind of only thing we hang our hopes on so um this is uh this is an opportunity for uh, those of you who are who are renewable advocates to uh pursue that further so that's uh just uh, just kind of announcement at the end here and uh we'll we'll have uh, some uh, some alerts and messages about how how we can uh, help advocate that uh, next slide please satchel um, and other other things other things you can do are uh, listen to HEA meetings. The next one's on March eighth, and uh, we also have a, a renewable discussion group that meets informally every Monday at noon. So you can uh, email me. My address is at the end of the presentation here. If you'd like an invitation to that, and uh, of course uh, this spring uh, HEA will be having a board of directors election, and. Uh, it's uh it's it's great to uh, to vote in that so that's that's probably the most important action you can do to uh to keep this uh, renewable progress rolling next slide please so uh there's there's my email uh there at the end uh bennett in the keeper.org so um yeah you can email me for that invitation to the renewable discussion group and uh, you can also find this presentation in our past repower presentations at inthekeeper.org uh, slash repower. Um, so I hope you'll, uh, you'll join us in March uh, when we talk about beneficial electrification. And uh, with that, uh, we'll, we'll end the slideshow and uh, open it up for audience questions. We are uh, pretty, pretty over, uh, very, very over our time limit, but uh, as long as any of you are willing to sort of stick around and talk about energy, I'll, I'll leave the Zoom open for our conversation. So um, are, there, are there any questions for, for our panelists or for anybody else in the room? All right. Well. I guess I guess we did a good job presenting then. So, um, well, uh, you all have my email address, and if uh, uh, there's uh, there's nothing else, we'll we'll call that a uh, a meeting. So, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you to the panelists, and uh, have a good night. Thanks for organizing, Ben. Thanks for all the uh, lots of interesting folks coming and and uh, presenting. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ben. Yep, much appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Yeah, thanks for organizing this, Ben. It's a great discussion. Mm -hmm. Good job, Ben. Thank you. Uh, did we end the recording? Uh, um, 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 uh.